The Elder Scrolls V Skyrim released on November 11th, 2011, five and a half years after its most recent predecessor, The Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion. In a similar fashion, GTA V released on September 17th, 2013, about five and a half years after its most recent predecessor, GTA IV. So it's now 2023. This year will mark the 10th anniversary of GTA V and the 12th anniversary of Skyrim, with sequels to both games technically on the horizon. Now, I'm very loosely using the word technically there, as there's pretty much no release window and very little info on what the games will be about. So we've already seen about double the release gap for these next games than we saw for the previous ones. And that's so far. There's no telling how much longer it'll be overall. Zoom out with the lens a little further and it starts to appear even worse. With Elder Scrolls 3 Morrowind releasing in 2002, a nine year gap between it and Skyrim, it's like saying if Oblivion never existed, there'd still have been a shorter gap between Elder Scrolls 3 and 5 than 5 and 6. Hell, why not discount Morrowind? Wind and Oblivion. Let's go back to Daggerfall, 1996, 15 years between it and Skyrim. With Starfield still not done and the studio not fully committed to Elder Scrolls 6 yet, it's safe to say at this point that there will be less time between Daggerfall and Skyrim than Skyrim and Elder Scrolls 6. And you know what? Let's just take this right to the top, since we're almost there. If Elder Scrolls 6 releases in 2028, which isn't out of the question since it'd be a reasonable five year gap from Starfield, then that means the time between all five current Elder Scrolls games of the main series, from 1994's Arena all the way to 2011's Skyrim, the first and last of those games will have as much time between them as the time we've waited simply and patiently between Skyrim and Elder Scrolls VI. Let's do the same with GTA. I won't bore you by breaking down each game again, so let us just jump back to the first one, 1997's Grand Theft Auto. That's a 16 year gap between 1997 and 2013, so provided GTA 6 releases before 2029, it won't attain that same morbid achievement. I'm personally more confident this won't be a thing, and we'll probably get GTA 6 sooner than Elder Scrolls 6. Still, it's a bit mad when looking at 2002's Vice City, as you realise that at least the same amount of time will pass between the vastly different Vice City and GTA 5 as GTA 5 and 6. But why am I throwing you enough dates that you'll dream of being in a maths class? tonight. Well, it's just utterly mental, isn't it? When you think about it, I mean, no disrespect to the studios, I'm sure they work very hard, and I love their games. I'm sure most of you do too, that's part of the problem. Because where are their games now? Why has this last decade or so seen such extraordinarily long gaps, when the previous one was able to pump out high quality titles every few years? Let's discuss. The prolonged release gaps between Elder Scrolls 6 VI and GTA 6 are undoubtedly influenced by a wide assortment of both internal and external factors. The evolution of games in general, the way people approach video games now compared to 10 years ago, the alternative products both studios rightfully want to also work on, as well as the unexpected long-term success which both of these games still enjoy. Indeed, Skyrim and GTA 5 are still played to this day by a surprisingly vast number of people and as a result, they have made and continue to make a lot of money. A report in 2016 cited Skyrim to have sold 30 million copies worldwide, and I'd guess now, in 2023, with all its extra re-releases, that figure's probably closer to 50 million, with billions of dollars accumulated as a result. GTA 5, on the other hand, with its still massively popular online mode, continues to rake in 15k every 10 minutes, or 1 billion a year, in revenue. These are remarkable figures for both Rockstar and Bethesda Game Studios, some of the highest achieving games the world has ever seen. Hell, GTA V is the highest grossing game the world has ever seen, and far outshines any movie by a long shot. In fact, not only do these games eclipse most other titles released by competitors today, they eclipse their own previous titles as well. But why is this? What sort of evolutionary step took place around this time, which took a game from lasting three or four years tops, to still being relevant after decades? Did they do something magically new and innovative, or are we just stuck playing these titles for lack of anything newer? Well, I think it's a little bit of both. There's no denying, the majority of GTA V's continued success comes from its GTA Online mode. This features a huge and ever-expanding array of guns, cars, apartments, and more, all of which must be purchased with in-game dollars. Acquiring these, of course, requires you to play the game, complete challenges, races, heists, all of which can take a lot of time and effort. Fortunately, for both Rockstar and players seemingly in a big rush, there is a quicker way. Just exchange some of your real-life hard-earned money for in-game currency by buying 
flying one of the cash cards named after various sharks. These range from Tiger Shark all the way up to Megalodon. And that brings me on to my main point about online mode. So long as the overall game itself doesn't become utterly outdated and not playable compared to modern titles, Rockstar have pretty much designed a perfectly sustainable closed loop profiting system. Players pay to quickly unlock new content, Rockstar take the money to develop yet more content, then players pay again to quickly unlock that content and on and on it spins. It's a similar financial structure to a lot of MMORPGs. The perpetual income generated from GTA Online, I believe, is the main reason GTA 6 has taken so much longer than any of its predecessors. Sure, there's other reasons too, and I'll get to them in a bit, but for the most part, I think we can confidently say that if you took away the online aspect of GTA 5, we would have had a GTA 6 by now. Then again, this is what it is, and who can blame them? When your studio is making $1 billion a year on a 10 year old game, why would you stop? It's similar to why Minecraft has just received updates for the past 50 15 years and will probably never get a Minecraft 2. I mean, there'd be no point, would there? Anyway, GTA Online mode is great and I'd be pretty torn if it came to a decision between scaling that back for GTA 6 or just keeping that going and waiting longer on GTA 6. So back to that second game. Skyrim of course doesn't have an online mode, not officially at least, and I've personally never tried the multiplayer mod, so can't comment on that, but I hear it was okay. Where GTA had great multiplayer and some mods then, let's say Skyrim is the other way around. Skyrim had some limited multiplayer and a plethora of great mods. And this is the biggest in-game reason I believe Skyrim still thrives today. The range of Skyrim mods is so vast that for the sake of this video's runtime I shall touch on but the most minute of few. We have entirely new regions like beyond Skyrim Bruma, with much of the rest of Tamriel to follow, someday. Then of course there's graphical and complete system and UI overhauls like Sky UI, and of course my favourite mod. Inigo, a Khajiit who is so much more than just a follower and is in fact the best, most immersive, well-written, comprehensibly interactive and responsive video game character I have ever seen created. Now if I could only play Skyrim with one mod ever again, it would be Inigo without a shadow of a doubt. Suffice it to say, the modders of Skyrim have taken what was already a vast and highly immersive world, and through the power of the creation kit, as well as raw passion and skill, kept this world fresh and updated. I think I've had about 8 or 9 big Skyrim playthroughs in my life, from Xbox 360 to my crappy laptop before eventually building a gaming PC, Skyrim has been with me the whole way. That being said, if it weren't for the fresh and exciting allure of mods, I'd probably have stopped after about the fourth playthrough. By that point, I'd already played my fair share of vanilla builds. I'd been a spellsword, who eventually became a stealth archer, a dual wielding mace barbarian, who eventually became a stealth archer, a mage, who eventually became a stealth archer, and finally a stealth archer from the get-go. By that point, I think I was quite happy to hang up my bow and call it quits for the rest of my life. There's a big world out there and I had other games I wanted to play, but then I kept reading about really cool sounding mods which would vastly enhance Skyrim's gameplay experience and allow me to finally achieve things in game which I'd previously only dreamed of. And with this, I thought, well shit, I want to experience that. And now here we are, a little over 11 years later, and I'm creating a YouTube video on the same bloody game. Which finally brings me on to something Something GTA and Elder Scrolls V have which previous titles do not, to near the same extent anyway. Re, re, re releases. In the time since both these games have existed, we've seen two new generations of consoles as well as the growing popularity of VR technology. In the case of GTA, we've seen it ported to every new PlayStation and Xbox as the years have gone on, with the continued success of online mode providing at least some justification behind why they're doing it. In the case of Skyrim, we've seen the same ports to new consoles, a very badly optimised VR edition which the modding community once again had to fix, as well as an anniversary edition wherein Bethesda went, screw it, it's been 10 years let's toss in all our creation club crap and sell it again. Now, we could pose the argument that if people are indeed buying it, then why not keep selling it? And Todd Howard himself has said as much before. What he's also said more recently though is this. I wish they didn't take as long as they did, but they do. And look, I mean, if I could go back in time, it would never have been my plan to wait as long as it's 
it's taken. Now, following on from this, I think the problem we have with both Skyrim and GTA re-releases is, of course, the studio want to make a quick and easy buck if they can. And re-releasing their most popular game again is a safe and surefire way to do that. The problem is it pushes everything back. By delegating time to working on a new version of an old game, manpower inevitably gets diverted away from the big new things like Elder Scrolls 6, GTA 6, and even maybe closer stuff like Starfield. Overall, to be honest, I'm not fully mad about some of the re-releases we've received. Skyrim Special Edition especially brought some much needed stability to many of the more complex Skyrim mods and allowed people to play with a much larger assortment of mods at the same time. First person in GTA 5 is also quite nice sometimes and I enjoy using it. These re-releases also however mark a crazy change in the way things work now. Instead of getting a brand new game every few years, we appear to be getting a brand new game every decade or so, and a re-release every few years. The most bizarre part of it to me is the fact that entire console generations last less time than some of these AAA RPG titles, and it marks a potentially dark future comprised of cheaply made, short-lived money spinners designed to keep us occupied whilst we wait for the next genre-defining title for longer than Pennywise waits down in the sewers before emerging to feast on the children of Derry. That's 27 years to anyone unfamiliar with the It book or movies. Now obviously something I've neglected to mention up to this point is the fact that big studios often make games for multiple IPs, and whilst being a different game, still take up the studio's time and manpower just as much. Bethesda of course have Fallout and now Starfield, whilst Rockstar's other most famous IP is Red Dead Redemption. They've also produced LA Noir, Bully and Max Payne 3 most notably, though these were all produced pre-2013 and thus can't be assessed to have an effect on GTA 6. In fact, the only large brand new game Rockstar have released since GTA 5 is Red Dead Redemption 2 in 2018, and granted it is a very big game, far larger than anything the studio had created before and is best exemplified by these map comparison images. See how the Red Dead 1 map is but a small part of Red Dead 2's? It's pretty cool. Jumping back to Bethesda for a second, we're almost at the second single player RPG since Skyrim, with Fallout 4 releasing in 2015 and Starfield hopefully coming later this year. They've also branched out a bit since then, working on games like Fallout 76, an MMORPG set in a nuclear West Virginia, and Elder Scrolls Blades and Fallout Shelter, mobile games set in the worlds of the studio's two popular IPs. Indeed, when considering the other projects both studios have been working on outside of their most famous titles, it's somewhat easier to forgive the long wait. But let's just rewind back to the way things used to work. Just for a minute, come on, it'll be fun. So there's five years between Oblivion and Skyrim, as we already established and that's certainly a very agreeable wait period. Skyrim is a huge game and five years of the studio's full dedication to make the thing is somewhat impressive. But hold up, because on the 28th of October 2008, Bethesda released Fallout 3, another huge RPG set within a nuclear apocalyptic Washington. It was no shallow feat to create this, especially considering how they'd only released Oblivion two years before. Further to that, Fallout 3 is still regarded as the best Bethesda Fallout game, with New Vegas being an Obsidian title, don't worry. Yet if we consider that Fallout 4 was released four years after an Elder Scrolls game as opposed to two, we begin to see the first signs of stretched release times. The pattern is similar with Rockstar, GTA 4 released in 2008, with Red Dead Redemption 1 following two years after in 2010. GTA 5 came three years after that in 2013, before we'd have to wait another five years for their next game. Red Dead 2 in 2018. So you see, on the whole, one might consider that at face value, the inclusion of other titles from the same studio might justify these very long waits between releases. But actually, break it down just a little bit, and it makes the whole thing appear much worse. It shows that games now lasting over a decade only actually saw three years of the studio's full dedication, yet now they're taking doubly as long, if not longer, on the next one. Now, I understand that a large factor in this issue is the fact that as technology becomes more advanced, the ceiling of required effort gets higher and programming subsequently takes longer. Compare game textures from the early 2000s to today, and this immediately becomes evident. And it's not just textures that have improved, it's general production quality. Voice acting is vastly better today, having become a larger and far more competitive market for actors like myself. Think back to Morrowind in 2002, most of the dialogue in that game was unvoiced 
waste and simply appeared in text boxes. Therefore, Morrowind was able to explore a lot more storytelling opportunities without the need to spend countless hours voicing every line of dialogue. Contrast that with the stellar acting in GTA V by the likes of Stephen Ogg, for example, who played Trevor, and the two are worlds apart. Quite literally, in fact. Every scene in GTA V would have required a director, rehearsal, copious tweaking, and individual devs couldn't just toss in bonus individual side quests here and there. Now, look, I don't pretend to know much about the intricacies of game development. I've made a few things here and there on Unity, and that's about it. But from my very rudimentary understanding, the more advanced a game becomes, the more systems one attempts to implement alongside one another, the more exponentially complicated programming is. It's like building a house of cards. Every new layer added on top requires one to go back and tweak every single other layer to a certain extent. Now, whilst publishers like Ubisoft can seemingly push out a new Assassin's Creed game every couple of years, games like that are more of a rehash of what came before, with a few new features and a new setting chucked on top. They can more easily build off of what they've already done. But building a brand new game from the ground up on a new engine with rapidly evolving technology coming and going every couple of years, that is simply more complicated and will inevitably take a lot more time, especially if you want to pad it out with the vibrancy and depth seen in Skyrim and GTA V. Overall, this doesn't negate the points I've already made, and I'm sure if Rockstar and Bethesda had prioritised their workload differently, we would have their sixth instalments by now. But we definitely shouldn't ignore the fact that more complex games of the future will just take longer to make, and that's only going to become more apparent as the decades roll on. It's quality over quantity, which is generally a good thing. It's just a shame that quality leaves us waiting longer and longer. Bethesda have said that they need to make Elder Scrolls 6 a decade-long game, and that is absolutely true. After such a long wait, that is the pressure they're under. Skyrim has lasted over a decade at this point, and is the main thing that's kept the passion for this franchise alive during this ridiculously long wait gap. Unless Bethesda are planning to narrow their release gap between Elder Scrolls 6 and 7, which would be nice but I doubt will happen, they'll need to do the same thing again. And one excellent way to ensure that they can do this is by selling an ongoing service not a done and dusted product. Indeed, this is exactly what GTA Online and modded Skyrim already are. And a huge factor behind these sudden long release gaps is the way the gaming market has evolved across this time. When GTA 6 finally arrives, it's going to somehow have to expand on that $1 billion yearly revenue, rather than risking its destruction. Kind of like that Obi-Wan Kenobi quote, but in reverse. It was said that you would join us and not destroy them! Now, I'm personally curious to see how Rockstar are going to do that, since wiping the slate clean, saying bye by Los Santos, hello again Vice City is a risky move. After all, people have sunk a lot of money into the currently existing GTA Online, and I imagine many might not want to wave bye bye to that and simply start again. Could there be a way to merge the GTA 5 and 6 maps together? Perhaps port characters to GTA 6 Online? Either way, I can see how this would pose a problem to the Rockstar devs, and can fully understand why they're not in any kind of rush to push out GTA 6. They simply don't need to be. Now, Elder Scrolls 6, similar has some bumpy terrain to navigate. Bethesda, after all, are very aware now of just how much mods boost the longevity of their games. Todd Howard's even mentioned some like Inigo in interviews, and said he himself plays with mods like SkyUI installed. Of course, this gargantuan modding community on places like the Skyrim Nexus is a completely free-to-play experience currently, and thus serves as a huge untapped treasure trove for Bethesda. Their answer to this was the Skyrim Creation Club, a range of paid mods available to buy to enhance your Skyrim experience. Things like new items and possibly a quest or two, I don't really know since I've only played with three mods from online because they are not only free, they are vastly better. Bethesda eventually realised this themselves and finally tied all their Creation Club mods into a neat little bow and sold them at a heavily discounted £15 for everything. People still complained about this though because in updating the base game for this anniversary edition, it caused everyone's proper mods to break. No doubt, going forward, Bethesda will want to somehow capitalise on the entire modding community, and I'm waiting for the situation with Starfield to shine some light on what exactly this might look like. Either way though, I imagine if Bethesda are directly involved, they'll want to somehow monetize this massive opportunity for their games. Whether that's a paper mod service, or to launch some subscription-based thing like Mod Game Pass, which may be a better, albeit more complicated alternative. Now, as annoying as it would be to have to suddenly start paying for mods, it might inspire more models 
Bethesda's to start creating, and hopefully the extra lining of Bethesda's pockets might lead to better and more numerous games overall. An optimistic perspective, sure, but you never know, maybe it'll shorten the release gap for Elder Scrolls 7 down to a mere 10 years, and we might get that before I'm 40. As negative and irritated as I've been about these long waits in this video, I actually think that in a way, this is a good thing. The games should be amazing, and far better than a Rust product which sadly lost some potential like Cyberpunk, which by the way I still love if my channel doesn't show that. One would hope that with the ridiculous amount of time given to working on such products and the future proofing that they seem to be factoring into them, they can't entirely go wrong. Hopefully. Either way, taking the time they need is the best way to go, and a lot of this extra waiting time is just a byproduct of how games have become more complicated to make over the years. Granted, the continued focus on previous titles has undoubtedly played its part in pushing things back, though if it's still doing well, I can sort of see why they keep going back to it. In the end, I'm not a developer. I don't know the specific goings on within these studios. All I can do is listen to what the devs have said, analyse release patterns over the years, and try to make accurate predictions, just like the rest of us. But to the devs at Rockstar and Bethesda, I just want to say thank you for the great games you've given us over the years. In fact, the only reason we're patiently, or I suppose impatiently, awaiting the next games are because they're so good, because we love them so much. And our irritated impatience is born out of love and adoration for the product. But personally, on balance, as annoying as it is sometimes to watch the years tick by with nothing new, I think I'm happy to wait for something amazing, as opposed to waiting less for something just about good enough. Finally, just for fun, I'm going to hazard a guess as to when we'll finally get these two games. From roughly assessing the current train as it stands, I think GTA might be 2024. This is six years after Red Dead 2, which itself had five years after GTA 5. Also, there's been more news and leaks floating around about GTA 6, with talks of a female protagonist and a Bonnie and Clyde style duo. The devs themselves have also confirmed that development for this game is well underway, so a late 2024 release certainly isn't off the table. Though 2025 would come as no surprise either. As for Elder Scrolls 6, I'm gonna guess that's still quite a long ways off, with Starfield having thrown a big old spanner in the works. Since that game itself has been delayed already, no doubt they're all hands on deck trying to finish up that right now, and probably won't get into the main phase of development for Elder Scrolls 6 until 2024. Assuming four years of full on development, that's somewhat short by today's standards, that suggests a release in 2028, though at this point that still feels a little bit optimistic to me, and I feel a lot more comfortable saying 2029. That's my guess, early to mid 2029, and in six years time, if I'm wrong, everyone will have forgotten anyway, hopefully. But if I'm right, don't worry, I will definitely be reminding you. Thank you very much for watching. This video is born out of 11 years of pent up impatience on my part, and it's been quite the relief to air these thoughts and feelings into a video. If you found this one informative, or it resonated with you, then don't forget to leave a like and share your thoughts down below. Are you still patiently awaiting either of these games, or have you fully given up at this point and moved on to other things? Well, one RPG that you can certainly enjoy today is Cyberpunk 2077. After its rocky release back in 2020, the game is now not only surviving, but also thriving, with a huge variety of ways to play and secrets to discover. Now, I've got tons of videos covering that game on this channel, with a new one coming every three to four days. If that sounds like your thing, then go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Thank you again for watching, I'm Sam Bram and I hope to play Elder Scrolls 6 and GTA 6 someday, but until then I'll be seeing you in another video.